Okay, I think we can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar on market impact of COVID-19. Today, Sally will talk with us about physical and mental health during COVID-19. Uh, Sally will have 20 minutes to present her research, and then we'll have 10 minutes of discussion. If you have any questions that you want me to send to Sally, to ask Sally at the end of the 20 minutes, please send it to me by chat. And if you have any clarification question, I can try and ask it during this. Thanks, Eric, and thanks everybody for joining. As I note here, this is very preliminary and we're really looking for feedback. And so please do either during this webinar or also feel free to reach out to us. This is joint with Osea Juntella and Kelly Hyde at University of Pittsburgh and Sylvia Sicarda at Carnegie Mellon University. So just briefly about our study, we've been running a study since January, 2019. And it's not because we anticipated COVID. We've been running a different study on wellness with a focus on sleep since January 2019, but we're now using the data from that study to examine uh, disruptions during COVID. So we've been running the study since January 19, January 2019, and each semester we enroll a new cohort of undergraduates who participate in a semester-long wellness study. And throughout this study, they wear Fitbits which allows us to track their physical activity and sleep along with their heart rate and other measures. And we give them repeated surveys that allow us to track their mental well-being. We also um, collect a host of other measures, demographics, time use, social interactions, which I'll come to. But the focus today will be on physical and mental health. And we think the big advantage of our study is that because we've been tracking these cohorts of undergraduates, we can examine what's happened during COVID-19, both compared to what those undergraduates were experiencing at the start of the semester before the pandemic, and compared to patterns in prior cohorts that, that didn't experience the pandemic. And that's sort of in comparison to some of the data that are being gathered now that have just started being gathered during the pandemic. We have this nice baseline data that we can then use to identify predictors for being at risk of depression during COVID-19. As, and as I'll show you, there's been these really big jumps in levels of depression among our undergraduate uh, population. So I'm just gonna start diving into the data. You'll see a couple figures that look like this. What this figure does is the red line is the pattern of average steps per day over the course of the spring 2019 semester, so last year, compared to the blue line, which tracks average steps per day over the semester for our current cohort of students, the spring 2020 cohort. And what you'll see is in February, the cohorts look very similar. They're both, both cohorts are walking about an average of nine to 10,000 steps per day. That stays pretty constant over the semester for the spring 2020 cohort, whereas for the spring 2020, uh, the current cohort, we see these really big drops in steps that stabilize in April. So in March, steps drop by about half to about 4,000 steps a day, so over half, and then stabilize through April. So really big drops in physical activity. You know, some of this probably isn't surprising, but we think it's important to document uh, this data through the Fitbit data, and then I'll show you how we link it all together. We also examine sleep. So this is average sleep duration over the semester. And here, what's interesting, we think, is that in spring 2019, the pattern was declining sleep over the semester, whereas what we see with the current cohort is that in March, again, coinciding with the pandemic, we see this increase in sleep, which then levels off in April. So students are sleeping about 40, 30 to 40 minutes more per night, and this is driven by waking up later, the bedtime stay up stable. I can show that data if we have time. Okay, now I'm gonna to turn to mental health. So for mental health, we use the CESD, the Center for Epidemiological, Epidemiologic Study Depression Scale, which is 20 questions, and the GAD-7, the Generalized Anxiety Disorder Assessment Score, which is seven questions. For both of these scales, there are statements given, I'll show you what they are, and then the response options range from zero, which means you rarely or none of the time experience this to three, which is that most or all of the time you're experiencing this. We conducted the mental health surveys at baseline at the start of the semester and end line at the end of the semester. And this year, we added a midline survey on March 20th after the first week of lockdown in Pittsburgh. So 
I'm going to first show you what the questions are. This is for the 2020 cohort. So the gray bars are baseline at the start of the semester. The orange bars are that midline survey right after the lockdown. And then the red bars are the end line survey at the end of the semester. Here are the anxiety questions. I was worrying too much about different things. I was so restless. It was hard to sit still. I was not able to stop or control worrying and so on. And what we see is that on all measures of anxiety, we see increases between baseline and end line. And they really, the big increases come at midline. Interestingly, the only thing that sort of switches its pattern is this last question. I felt afraid like something awful might happen. We see really big jumps at midline, which return back towards baseline, but are still higher at end line. But in general, the pattern is of increasing anxiety over the course of the semester on all of these questions. Here are the depression scale questions. People were unfriendly, my sleep was restless, and so on, the 20 questions. Here, what I think is interesting is that on some questions, we don't see very big changes. For instance, people were unfriendly. We don't see, real, we don't see much change between baseline and endline, which kind of makes sense. The pandemic hasn't really affected that. If, in fact, there's some evidence anecdotally that people are being more friendly, you know, all the emails start with, I hope you're doing well during this time and so on. But we see really big changes in generalized measures like I was happy, I enjoyed life. We're seeing big drops in those measures and then big drops in measures like I felt hopeful about the future. Um, and, you know, basically I, I felt lonely. We're seeing big increases in that. Um, and so, you know, across the board, we're seeing in general movements in the, in the, in the direction of greater depression. So some of these some of these questions, if they move up, that's more towards depression. Some of them, if they move down, they're more towards depression. When we put these measures together in the scale, so what you do to create the scale is you just add up someone's scores on the scale to get a total score. What we're seeing are these really big jumps in both anxiety and depression compared both to baseline, so that's the gray bars, and to the patterns we saw in the spring 2019 cohort. So in the spring 2019, we do see small increases between baseline and endline, but nothing like the jumps we're seeing in the current cohort. So if we run a difference in difference analysis, we're seeing these big changes, again, both compared to students' own baseline measures and compared to the kinds of changes we've seen over the semester and prior cohorts. One thing I wanna really focus on is the CESD scale. 15 is considered the cutoff for being at risk of depression. So what we're seeing now in both our midline and endline survey is that our sample on average is significantly above the cutoff for being at risk of clinical depression. And that's what we're gonna focus on uh, for the rest of the time. So here we're looking at a distribution of the CESD scores at baseline on the left and at end line on the right. And what you see, the, the vertical black line is the, the cutoff for being at risk of clinical depression. What we're seeing is that at baseline, about 30% of our sample was at risk for clinical depression, which is already a high rate. But you see in end line that more than doubles to 64%, right? We're seeing this really big shift. So one way we're thinking about the data is that about 30% of our sample starts off at risk of depression. Another third of our sample moves into being at risk for depression during COVID and another third remains below the threshold. And so what we wanna understand is what's driving this heterogeneity, these differences? Why do some students seem to be more at risk of depression during COVID than others? And again, this really big jump, right? A more than doubling of, um, and you know, having over 60% of our students being at risk of clinical depression, it kind of it aligns with what we're seeing um, sort of more broadly, this, this rising concern about mental health during the pandemic and social distancing. So what we do, and this is more preliminary and where we're really looking for feedback, is we have a lot of data on these students, as I mentioned. And so what we want to do is use mach machine learning techniques to identify risk factors for depression during COVID-19. We use our demographic measures, our pre-COVID uh, measures of mental health, our pre-COVID measures of activity and sleep that come from the Fitbit, and also pre-COVID measures of time use that come from time use surveys that we um, have students fill out weekly. 
If you're looking for more detail on the machine learning algorithm, we use the XG Boost Extreme Gradient Boosting Algorithm with the Decision Tree Booster. It's similar in approach and interpretation to the random forest algorithm. So people who are unfamiliar, basically the idea of these algorithms is they look at the data and they split the data first on the factor that explains the most variation in the data. And here we're trying to explain variation and whether you are above this threshold of 15. And then it continues to split the data on the most important factors, those factors that explain the most variation in the data. We, um, the model selected 55 of 133 potential, potential predictors and achieves 97.7% accuracy. It, it, predicts, it correctly predicts all the cases of students who are above the threshold. It's a little less accurate on predicting uh, scores that are below 15. So just to give you a sense of what we are finding, it, you know, one check of the model is that it makes intuitive sense, right? So the most impact, important factors are listed, their factors here are listed in, in order of importance in terms of how much variation they explain. And these colors are just sort of clusters of their, their, they're grouped by their importance. So it's reassuring to see that baseline GAD7 and baseline CESD are the most important predictors for N-line CESD, right? So if you're you know, more likely to be depressed at baseline, you're also more likely to be depressed at N-line. But I think what's really valuable about our data is that sort of if you look at the top 10 most important predictors, some of them come from our time use survey, like activity hanging out with friends. That's how, how much time you report hanging out with friends. Or activity watching TV, how much time you report spending watching TV. Other measures are coming from our mental health survey measures, our mental well-being survey measures. And then we also have measures coming from the Fitbit data about both sleep and activity. So I think this really highlights how important it is to have measures of mental health and the biometric measures from the Fitbit as well as these time use measures because they all turn out to be important predictors. And I think what's most interesting is when you look at the relationship between these predictors and depression, this is where I was most surprised, right? Because generally we think, okay, this makes sense, right? We, these are the kinds of things that we're told are, are good for preventing depression, hanging out with friends, being active, getting a good night's sleep. But when we look at our data, some of these things do not have the relationship we expected. So let me, let me wrap up with that. So what these lines show are that you can sort of think of them as the marginal effects on sleep. So, excuse me, the marginal effects on um, your risk of depression. So if it's a negative number, that means you're less likely to be depressed at end line. If it's a positive number, you're more likely to be depressed. So what is this first curve says? It, it says that people that have low anxiety scores at baseline are less likely to be depressed and people who have high anxiety scores at baseline are more likely to be depressed. That makes a lot of sense, right? The second one is similar. If you have low life satisfaction at baseline, you're more likely to be depressed. If you have high life satisfaction at baseline, you're less likely to be depressed. The CESD score follows a similar pattern, right? You're more likely to be depressed if you have a higher baseline CESD score. I think where things get interesting is when you look at something like activity hanging out with friends. This is time spent with friends before COVID. People who spent more time with their friends before COVID are more likely to be depressed now. So it's kind of the opposite of, we usually think that hanging out with friends is a good thing. But now in COVID, if you're someone who used to spend a lot of time with friends, it looks like now you're more likely to be depressed, which when you step back and think about it, it makes sense because maybe there's been a lot of disruption to being able to hang out with your friends. We're finding something similar with sleep. The higher quality your sleep was before COVID, you're actually more likely, you're more at risk of depression now. We see something similar with steps. People who were taking sort of the average number of steps before are at higher risk than people who were inactive, right? Again, we, we want to investigate this more, but what it suggests is that people who used to take a lot of steps, now we saw that big disruption in steps. They're not taking as many steps now. People who were inactive at baseline, maybe they've experienced fewer disruptions. Um, similarly, <laughs> I kind of like this one. People who didn't watch very much TV at baseline, again, are more at risk 
than people who watched a lot of TV. Again, you know, it might make sense once you think about it, because again, maybe the people who didn't watch a lot of TV, they're the ones whose life has been dis has changed the most in COVID. But again, a lot of these things move in the opposite direction of what the normal associations are between lifestyle and depression. And so we think that COVID to some extent seems to have turned upside down the normal relationships between mental well-being and how you spend your time and being active and physical health. So that's something that we want to investigate more. So our next steps are to refine the machine learning model and compare risk factors during COVID to pre-COVID. You know, is it what I'm saying correct that the, the risk factors have almost turned upside down during COVID? And then as a next step, use our descriptive analysis to motivate interventions that could help improve physical and mental health, right? If it is that these disruptions to physical activity and hanging out with friends are leading to depression, maybe we can foster those kinds of connections through uh, interventions. I think that's all I had. I just know it kind of went fast, but um, I wanted to leave time for questions. Okay, thank you, Sally. Uh, we have a couple of questions here and hopefully we'll get some more. Uh, first of all, Ken Wilbur is asking, is it possible to distinguish between the mental health effects of the pandemic and mental health effects of the shelter in place policy? Yeah, I think that's difficult. I know that there's another survey out there that uses geographic variation and when the shutdown orders came and they do, they do compare mental health to in places where it's going to get shut down but hasn't yet to places where it's already shut down and i think they are finding evidence that the shutdown is driving a lot of this the social distancing we don't i don't we don't have that same type type of variation in our data we do have some we have some variation in how disrupted your life was for instance if you lived in pittsburgh versus you were sent back home to a place that maybe was exposed to a little bit more shut down, but I think our data is probably not as, as well suited for that as this other paper that I can send you. So a related question from Courtney. Uh, are you able to see a change in students' response once they were forced to return home versus re, uh, remaining on campus? Yeah, so again, it's a bit correlated, of course, right? But um, they were sent, they, it's a little bit interesting because what happened with our students is they went, they left campus, or a lot of them did, for spring break. And then basically spring break got extended, and then they just were never allowed to come back again. And so um, the disruption happened at this sort of strange time of spring break, and so it's a little bit hard to disentangle all those effects. But again, we can somewhat take advantage of the fact that some students had to go sort of farther from campus than others, and we will look into that. Thank you. Um, Kanishka is asking, just a second, are there differences for graduating student versus others? Trying to tease out the social effects versus economic effect. Alternatively, can we uh, tease out students with scholarship, financial aid versus students paying full tuition? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think we've looked at the graduating students. I think our students tend to be um, a bit younger, but we can see if we can look at variation in that. We have looked at the financial aid piece, and that again moves in maybe a direction you wouldn't expect. We're actually finding smaller effects for students who are on financial aid, and we're trying to understand why that might be the case. So again, a lot of the effects are counterintuitive, I would say, um, and we're trying to understand why that is. Um, another question I'm rephrasing, basically what you found is that the people that were less social were affected less by this. So maybe uh, you're, you're suggesting that a good way to live your life is being antisocial, just to be, just to be on the safe side? Well, that's <laughs> exactly right. So people like me that are really inactive, have no friends, you know, Normally, we're the unhealthy people. It's only in COVID that, you know, my life is well designed, is well designed for, for only for COVID, right? Not for regular circumstances. And that's, 
what we're trying to understand. That's why I was sort of saying it seems to have turned things upside down from the usual associations. And I think it's because of what Ken said, because of the social distancing, right? That, you know, you aren't able to go out and be as, a, as active, to interact with friends and so on. And so we think a lot of it might be about changes, that people who experience the biggest changes are the ones who are most uh, susceptible to becoming depressed. We want to dig into that more in the data. A question from Vanessa, I'm rephrasing. Basically, do you have personality traits? So can you tell us about differences between introverts and extroverts? Anything of the sort? Mm, I don't think. Um, I should, I, I know my co-authors are on the call, but they're muted. <laughs> I don't think we did big Five, but um, I think we took things like time preferences. Um, so we can we can try to look into that. We I, I should say every every measure we took of people gets thrown at that machine learning model. And one thing that's interesting, at least so far in our estimation, if you notice, one thing that didn't pop out of our machine learning model was demographics. For instance, we don't see gender as being a an important predictor or financial aid, like Kanishka asked. All of that is in there. And none of that is selected by the model. Of course, we need to refine the model, but so far it doesn't look like sort of demographic or personality traits. We do have a measure of resilience, you know, how well I, I, I'm, I'm good at bouncing back from stressful events. We have a few measures of resilience, which right now don't seem to be emerging from the model. So as interesting as what does come out is sort of what doesn't come out. Thank you. A question from Ron Dupai. Have there been any learning studies done on these students? There is a test established by UCLA that quantifies loneliness. Um, what was the first part of your question? Have there been there loneliness, loneliness studies done on these students? Yeah, so we weren't focused on loneliness in our, in our larger study. But once COVID came into play, we now focus a lot more on loneliness. So we're asking people about their social interactions more explicitly, you know, how many phone calls, how many video calls, how many texts, how many in-person interactions. And we're also surveying them weekly about loneliness. So we don't have the baseline data on that to use as predictions, but we can at least look, we will look at associations in the data. Another question from Courtney about gender differences. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're not finding large gender differences. A little bit, it, I think women are a little bit more at risk, but it's not significant. And again, it's not emerging from our prediction model. And, you know, I think this is different than what we're seeing in the data that I mentioned before when I was answering Ken's question. Among adults, I think that we are seeing um, that women are significantly more at risk of depression during COVID. And that might be, you know, that those are women who are maybe married with children and they're bouncing jobs and kids. They don't necessarily find that that explains the difference, but, you know, maybe among undergraduates, those gender differences um, in terms of life circumstances at least aren't quite as important. From Sahil, uh, is it possible to identify participants who have crossed beyond, behind the at risk of depression threshold? If yes, are there any mechanisms in place within the survey setup to intervene and address their issues? That have crossed over what? Uh, at risk of depression. So I guess you have, you know, people in close to depression and people that are depressed. Yeah, I mean, you know, this entire sample is considered at risk, you know, you might really be concerned about the people out here. Um, and, you know, that is something we should think about whether we should sort of really reach out to those people and make sure that they're, um, you know, getting the resources they need for support. I think that's, that is important. Thank you. Ali is asking, uh, would we be able to keep tracking this data in the future? It would be neat to see whether behavior bounced back. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you're reviewing any of our funding proposals, <laughs> please say that, you know, we've, that's exactly what we're doing now. So we've cobbled together, we're sort of going into debt to make sure we hold on to these people. 
um, but we are applying for funding to, you know, they're so value, they're so valuable in terms of the data because we have their baseline measure. So we're trying to track them as long as possible. You know, it's, it's a little bit difficult to keep them engaged. So we do have attrition as a problem, but we do have a core set of people that the study was supposed to end at the end of the spring semester, but we basically have had people keep their Fitbits, which are hard to return right now anyway, and we're trying to keep them engaged with syncing their Fitbit and answering these surveys. Great, thank you. So we have a couple of more minutes. Uh, do you want to sum it up, give us some something to take away with us? Those are all, those are all the questions. No, that's my question. <laughs> do I want to sum give it up? Give us some takeaways. What should um, we remember from this? I mean, to me right now, at least at the current stage of our analysis, the two big takeaways for me is that there's been a huge impact on mental health, a really, you know, a really troubling impact on mental health. And that the usual associations of what we think helps with mental health and improves mental health from the prior research seems to be turned upside down here, which means that we really need to understand mental health during the pandemic in a new way because it might be the case that sort of the old relationships aren't holding right now. And we, need, we want to understand more whether it's about just about changes or again, you know, the social distancing, maybe a social distance is lifted. Um, you know, some of this will naturally undo itself. And, you know, going back to the idea of tracking people, we'll see if it naturally kind of bounces back um, or whether we really need interventions to um, address this. And again, maybe my biggest takeaway is if people have any thoughts about this, especially the prediction models, we're looking, you know, we would really love feedback on the machine learning models because we have a small data set, but a lot of data on each person. And so we're under, trying to understand the most disciplined way to identify risk factors um, with our data. So I, I'm really, we're really seeking feedback on that for the, for the machine learning people in the audience. Can maybe end up with Ken's uh, insight. He said that everybody, and needs to start watching more TV immediately. That's that's his insight from this. No, you, you need to go back to January uh, and watch more TV. It's too yeah. late. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think that we ran out of time. Thank you, Ari, for moderating.